So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to our um, first Gynonc uh, webinar. This is exciting and, and we're very excited for you all to be here. Um, hopefully future ones uh, will be not on online or over Zoom and uh, you, you will be able to see each other and meet each other. Um, but for now, we'll continue with Zoom. Um, so today we're gonna talk a bit about evaluation and management of vulvar dysplasia or vulvar neoplasia and a couple of other vulvar conditions. Unfortunately, we are limited on time. And as you all know, there are many different vulvar conditions, um, some that we see often, others that we don't, um, but we'll try to cover some of the more common lesions that we do see and treat so that we are all on the same page um, with respect to management and how to properly diagnose. So um, the outline for today's talk is to review the contemporary terminology for VIN. And I put VIN in quotes here because uh, the terminology has been updated uh, most recently in 2015, but we continue to use uh, VIN and we commonly see VIN in our pathology reports. Uh, we'll talk about how to diagnose L-cell and H-cell of the vulva or low and high grade dysplasia of the vulva and define different treatment, treatment options um, for the low grade lesions, but more specifically, we'll focus on vulvar H cell as well as differentiated VIN, and then the treatment options for other vulvar dermatoses. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna focus on lichen sclerosis because that's something we certainly see quite often. And lichen sclerosis, as you know, is intimately involved with differentiated VIN um, and can lead to cancer. Uh, so I wanted to, to cover that um, and in addition to, to like in plainness. This case presentation is, is a hypothetical patient, but she is reminiscent of patients um, that I've seen before and I'm sure you have seen in clinic. This might be a common scenario because of the pandemic, um, but this thing, fictitious case um, helps me underscore a couple points that I wanna start out by making. Um, so Mrs. Smith, she's a 68 year old who presents to the GYN office complaining of 12 months of persistent itching and irritation in the genital area. Her last GYN visit was approximately four years ago. And she was told, she um, in asked, and when, when asked why, she mentions that when, when I turned 65, I was told that I no longer needed to see a GYN anymore. Over the course of the last 12 months, she had called her provider about three times and was prescribed topical or oral antifungals each time for the symptoms that she was having and unfortunately did not have much relief. Finally, she was referred to see her gynecologist who performed an office examination and the patient was noted to have several hypopigmented lesions along the bilateral labia, menorah, and, and, and perineum. So the differential diagnosis for vulvar lesions is quite broad. Um, the more common ones being vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia or VIN, um, which is now also known as vulvar squamous intraepithelial lesion. So they're, um, they're now defined as vulvar sills. Uh, that's the most contemporary terminology. But other lesions can be like in sclerosis, like in simplex chronicus, like in planus, which might not be um, hypopigmented lesions as described in this hypothetical case scenario, um, but certainly is among the differential diagnosis. We can also see psoriasis and vulvar cancer can certainly present in this fashion. So how do we figure out, how do we work up this patient? Um, number one, um, a physical exam. It's important that we perform a, a history, a thorough history, review the patient's um, exposures, does she smoke? Has she had HBV before? Has she ever been diagnosed with a vulvar condition in the past? Um, and then performing a targeted physical examination, including a speculum exam, even though she has uh, primarily external genitalia symptoms, it's important to perform a, specu a speculum exam as well to rule out abnormal discharge that, um, or other findings that may be related to whatever is going on externally and then um, performing an inguinal nodal examination too to feel for any lymphadenopathy. Um, part of this exam may include performing cultures to rule out an infection such as, such as a yeast infection. Certainly patients may have 
vulvar irritation and vulvar itching for uh, a multitude of reasons. And so there may be more than one thing going on. So certainly performing cultures to rule out infection is never, um, is never wrong. Um, and they certainly can have a yeast infection that may have been refractory to the medication uh, that she's already received. Vulvoscopy is an important part of an exam, particularly if you see any abnormal lesions, and this can be performed in the office. It is important to, to point out that when performing a vulvoscopy as opposed to colposcopy when examining the cervical vaginal tissue, because the, the tissue of the vulva is thicker, it's uh, keratinized, you need to soak the, the skin for longer. Um, so it's important to actually soak the vulva with 3% or 5% acetic acid solution for several minutes, up to five minutes before carefully inspecting the vulva with the colposcope. Um, and I, I think that that's a little challenging to do. You know, we all are busy in clinic and it's hard to just, um, you know, sit and wait for five minutes, but you can certainly soak four by fours with the 3% the or the 5% acetic acid solution. Um, and place that on the patient's genitalia um, and, and have the patient wait either with you in the room or you can step away for a few minutes while the, while the tissue is irrigating and then not to be shy about continuing to reapply the acetic acid during your inspection while performing the vulvoscopy um, because it's, it's important to, to help with properly evaluating all the tissue. The other thing to point out when performing vulvoscopy is that sometimes the, we can over-interpret acetyl-white changes within the vulva, particularly um, within the, the um, vestibule and along the perineum, and, and in particular in postmenopausal patients. So um, it's important not to, to overread these findings. And then if there's any abnormality whatsoever, please biopsy these lesions. Um, so we'll go on to that. And so Vulvar biopsy is something also that takes time and, and sometimes in our busy clinics, it's hard to fit this in if you're not um, planning or anticipating to do biopsies for patients. And if you have a lot lined up, um, it can be difficult to do so. So for some patients, you can certainly, um, patients that you are know, know that are reliable, you can ask them to come back for vulvar biopsy if, it's, if you're just too pressed on time. Um, but I do try to get these patients biopsied when I'm seeing them just to to get that captive audience right, who's right in front of me so that they don't um, run away. And so if I, if I am able to get a patient to consent to do this in the office, if they feel comfortable doing it in the office as opposed to the operating room, um, I do it right there during their appointment. I'm sure most of you are doing these in your offices, but just briefly as a recap, after um, properly positioning them and identifying the lesions, uh, it's important to use local anesthesia to to make sure that they can, the patient can tolerate the procedure. And you can use a one to 2% lidocaine solution with or without epinephrine. The epinephrine helps to reduce bleeding um, or blood loss during the, during the biopsies. Um, so that's helpful, but not necessary. You wanna use a very small needle, needle. As you know, this is a very uncomfortable injection. It's a very sensitive area, particularly if you're performing biopsies around the clitoris. So using a 30 gauge needle, if it's available in your office. Um, is helpful. And, and you can, if you have access to topical lidocaine, um, try to numb the skin prior to even performing the subdermal injection of the lidocaine uh, to make it that less um, painful for the patient. In general, I use a three millimeter or a four millimeter keys punch biopsy. Four millimeter is preferable to get a large enough biopsy, um, but if you're biopsying around the clitoris, the smaller biopsy size is also better. Um, and don't be afraid to biopsy patients who are on anticoagulation. I biopsy patients on anticoagulation all the time. If, you're, if you feel uncomfortable about it or if it's uh, a lesion that looks ulcerated, um, is exophytic, is already bleeding when you're examining them, certainly don't feel pressure to, to biopsy those patients because they certainly can bleed more than you want them to. Um, but a small lesion that, that doesn't look ulcerated or um, is not overly suspicious for cancer can be biopsied without significant blood loss. Um, and certainly if you're using epinephrine that can, that can help minimize the blood loss. Um, hemostasis can then be achieved after the biopsy with silver nitrate or Monsil solution. And if you have access to pleural monocryl or vicryl in the office, 
Um, you can also throw an interrupted to reapproximate the skin edges. And the use of the monocryl or vicryl stitch as opposed to silver nitrate, which is actually what I use most often because it's just easier to get access to the silver nitrate in the clinic. Um, but use of the stitch can actually help to accelerate healing and can be more comfortable for the patient after the biopsy. So if you do have access to the stitches, um, the sutures in the office, um, I, would, I would recommend using them. Obviously, if patients aren't amenable to doing a biopsy in the office, don't hesitate to bring these patients to the operating room to do biopsies. Um, it's, in, it's really important to, to make sure that you do make a definitive diagnosis. Um, and I make a point here, if, if you feel that a lesion is, um, is very concerning and if it appears suspicious on your exam or your bulboscopy, but your biopsy result is discrepant, I would encourage you to biopsy them again um, or get a second opinion on the pathology or refer this patient to um, Dr. McKinney in the vulvar specialty clinic here at BI um, or any one of us in the gynoc division so that we can examine and, and um, render our opinions and maybe biopsy these patients um, because you don't wanna just, you know, I, I, you wanna trust your gut. And I think if, if you feel that there's something going on on someone's exam, you don't want to, to ignore it because the pathology didn't, uh, didn't show something very concerning. So in terms of pathophysiology for vulvar dysplasia, anywhere of the anal genital epithelium can have um, a sill or a squamous intraepithelial lesion. Uh, if we go back to our embryology days, the cervix, the vagina, vulva, including the perineum, the anus, and the distal three centimeters of the rectum to the dentate line all um, share the same embryologic origin, and they're all susceptible this, to the same toxins and exogenous agents, so they can all develop uh, squamous intraepithelial lesions. Um, so you can have multiple lesions or multifocal lesions within the same anatomic landmark, so multiple um, cells within the vulva, but you can also have multicentric disease, meaning there's multiple lesions within the cervix, the vagina, the vulva, and the anus. So when patients do have an HPV infection and present with cervical dysplasia, for example, make sure that you're always also doing a thorough inspection of the vagina and the vulva. And if you feel comfortable, the anus, um, certainly patients who are um, HIV positive or immunocompromised may have um, multicentric disease more often than patients who are not. And, and I find it useful to collaborate with um, our colorectal uh, surgical colleagues when analyzing um, the anal area and the rectal area to make sure that we're properly evaluating and monitoring these patients um, because um, sometimes I just don't feel comfortable uh, managing or treating the, the anal dysplasia. So it's, it's um, help, helpful to be collaborative in those situations so that we're treating the, all of the disease, the whole patient. Um, risk factors for vulvar high-grade dysplasia and differentiated bin, um, there, are, there are several. Uh, High-risk HPV, in, including the, the oncogenic, oncogenic strains of HPV that are well known to cause cervical cancer can also be associated with vulvar high-grade dysplasia. Um, immunodeficiency, as I mentioned, so patients uh, who are HIV positive or are on chronic steroids or immunosuppressants, um, they're at risk for developing high-grade dysplasia. And smoking certainly increases the risk of vulvar dysplasia similar to cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer. Uh, other vulvar dermatoses put patients at risk for developing differentiated VIN, such as lichen sclerosis. Um, and differentiated VIN has um, a greater likelihood of developing into vulvar cancer. So it's these patients that you need to watch very closely. In terms of prevention, unfortunately, there's no you know, great screening test like we have for cervix cancer. Um, but prevention mainly includes administration of the HPV vaccine. We do know that the non-avalent vaccine is um, helpful in preventing up to 90% of HPV-associated vulvar carcinomas, similar to 90% of cervical carcinomas. So encouraging um, patients to, to get the HPV vaccine if they haven't yet received it, and obviously encouraging our um, younger and adolescent patients to get it if they haven't, if you are seeing a patient population of that age group. Smoking cessation is a big one. Um, obviously it's helpful to stop smoking for many, many reasons, but certainly for patients with HPV, uh, smoking cessation can help to prevent cervical dysplasia, vulvar dysplasia, um, as well as carcinoma. Um, 
Identifying and treating lichen sclerosis and lichen planus can also help to prevent the development of differentiated VIN, and we'll talk more about that in a few, few slides. And then just early identification. So this also has to do with the patient um, coming in for those annual exams, making sure that even if they've had normal pap smears up until age 65, that they don't disappear and they do come back for their, their general GYN exams every one to two years, depending on what um, we're allowed to do based on their, their medical insurance. But I hate when they disappear because they've been told that they're 65, they don't ever need a GYN exam anymore. We all know that there's still GYN anatomy there. Um, things can still happen um, and things still develop after age 65. So um, try to capture these patients and make sure that they don't um, run away from us too early so that we can identify these lesions or these abnormalities and dysplasias early and uh, treat them before they become problems. So what's in a name? Um, I do want to review the updated and contemporary terminology just briefly. We're all very familiar with VIN 1, VIN 2, and VIN 3, which was the original nomenclature um, dating back to 1986. The terminology for vulvar dysplasia has changed a bit over the last 20 plus, 20-ish years. Um, in 2004, the International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease changed the categories from VIN 1, VIN 2, and 3 to um, condyloma or HBV effect um, as, the cat as being synonymous with VIN 1. And then the VIN 2 and 3 or the high grade dysplasia became known as VIN usual type. And there were three sub, sub classifications, VIN warty type, VIN basaloid type, and then VIN mixed type, which included both warty and basaloid types. Um, and then finally differentiated VIN doesn't change across the board. In 2015, the International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease changed the um, nomenclature again and changed the terminology from just condyloma or HP of HPV effect to LCIL of the vulva, which was more in line and consistent with another group that had changed the terminology to just LCIL and HCIL. So now um, these diagnoses should be considered or labeled as LCIL of the vulva, and this encompasses the low-grade VIN-1 dysplasia. Um, so they're considered, they're labeled as vulvar LCIL, also known as condyloma or just HP effect, HPV effect. These are associated with HPV, um, but not the carcinogenic or not the oncogenic strains of HPV, usually associated with HPV 6 and 11. These are not considered precancerous. So we want to know about them, but we don't really worry about them. And the second category is H cell of the vulva. So these are the high grade squamous, squamous, excuse me, squamous intraepithelial lesions of the vulva, um, also known as VIN 2 and 3. These are considered precancerous. So this is the VIN usual type category. These are the dysplasias that we do want to treat because they are indeed precancerous. And then finally, the other category of high grade dysplasia is differentiated VIN. And this again is more virulent, virulent um, dysplasia compared to the H cell, but not associated with HPV. So in other words, um, LCIL, again, is sort of synonymous with VIN-1 or condyloma, not considered precancerous. We worry about it, but we don't need to treat them. HCIL is um, otherwise known as VIN-2 or VIN-3 or usual type VIN, and this is associated with carcinogenic HPV. Um, and then the other form of high-grade dysplasia is DVIN. This is not associated with HPV, but is instead associated with vulvar dermatoses such as lichen sclerosis. For the purposes of this talk, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna focus a lot of our discussion in terms of treatment and management on the high-grade dysplasias in DVIN. Um, because again, while we, we care about VIN-1 or LCIL, um, these are not things that we absolutely need to treat because they are not precancerous. And so um, how do we treat? It, again, depends on the pathology and diagnosis. For LCIL, it's reasonable to observe these patients unless they're symptomatic or they have bulky disease. Um, and then there are several options, three options for vulvar HCIL um, and really just one option for DVIN, and we'll talk about that. So for LCIL briefly, um, again, equivalent to condyloma or VIN-1, not precancerous. Um, we get excited about it, but 
really, um, we don't need to treat these unless patients are quite symptomatic. So if patients are itchy or they're um, having pain from a lesion or if a lesion has gotten really large and is bleeding, then certainly you can um, treat these lesions, but they don't absolutely need to be treated. And in terms of treatment options, it is patient and provider preference. There are topical medications that can be applied in the office. As you know, there are medications that patients can apply at home. Um, certainly you can excise lesions, uh, particularly for big bulky genital warts. Um, and then laser can be used as well. I would say, and, and this is um, mentioned in the committee opinion, number 675, that for condyloma in a postmenopausal woman, these should be biopsied to make sure that it doesn't actually represent some other pathology. And then certainly patients who are being treated for presumed genital warts but aren't responding to therapy, these lesions should be biopsied as well. Um, so in terms of options for treatment in the office, I, I use TCA for patients who have genital warts. Um, obviously, you want to counsel the patient about the potential side effects that each of these options may uh, may cause. And so um, if patients have a lot of disease, I typically stage and treat these patients, um, or excuse me, treat these patients in stages. So I may have them come back for several visits if they have a lot of genital warts, so they're not, so they're not having their entire vulvar area exfoliate off after their initial treatments. Um, but patients need to be counseled that this it will be a stepwise and potentially a dragged out process. Um, they can use a miquimod and pedophilin at home. Um, and then certainly for bulkier disease, you can use um, excision, um, which, is, which is my preference. They, they all are associated with a, um, somewhat of a recurrence rate. So there's no absolute fix for the treatment of the genital warts. Um, and I, but again, these are, these are options. And um, in, in general, you wanna prioritize medical management, switch to a different medical management if there's no response within three weeks. Um, or there's incomplete clearance at six to 12 weeks. And then in general, we can reserve surgical therapy for ELSA or genital warts um, for patients that have bulkier disease or are more symptomatic or are not responding to any of the medical options. So we'll move along to the treatment for HCIL and differentiated VIN. So the goals of treatment for vulvar HCIL include um, the desire to destroy the lesion, and prevent cancer because again we know that the, the vulvar H cell can progress to cancer in up to nine to ten percent of cases. We want to improve their symptoms. So if they're having significant itching or pain, dysuria, we want to, to address that lesion to prevent these symptoms, improve these symptoms. We want to exclude invasion because occult uh, invasive cancer can be present. And preserve vulvar anatomy and function and then avoid recurrences. Unfortunately, there's no perfect therapy available that can accomplish all of these five goals. Um, there's a little bit of give and take. And so you have to figure out how to strike a balance and treat the patient, the individual in front of you um, when deciding which is the most appropriate treatment option. Um, because vulvar H cell is a precancerous lesion and has a greater risk of progression to cancer, we need to treat these patients. All patients with H cell do need some form of treatment. In addition to the treatment that we provide, um, it, it's important to counsel the patients about lifestyle modifications, including smoking cessation, which we already mentioned. And then um, the options that we have available include surgical excision, ablative therapy, which includes laser therapy, or um, ultrasonic aspiration, which is what I use sometimes, which is also known as Sonopet and topical therapy. So surgical treatment. So um, this is something that I feel most comfortable doing. Um, and because, you know, as a gynecologist, this is what we do, we, we cut things out. And so it's something that I certainly feel more comfortable doing, but it's not um, everyone's comfort level. Uh, when we do perform a wide local excision for, for vulvar dysplasia, um, the goal is to get clean margins. And so this procedure might not be the best option for patients who have lesions that are near important structure, um, anatomic structures, such as the clitoris, the urethra, the vaginal introitus, or the anus, anything um, that might be compromised in terms of anatomy or function of that structure with the excision. And so you do have to be careful and thoughtful about who you select when performing a wide local excision. 
Um, you want to ask, you know, is this lesion, um, where is this lesion? How big is this lesion? What, you know, get a sense before you bring a patient to the operating room of how large that excision will be um, so that you have a good sense of how big the repair might need to be. Do you need to get plastic surgery involved to do a flap? Can you close this primarily in the operating room without plastic surgery? Um, and then do you have any level of suspicion for cancer? How big do you need, how deep do you need to make this dissection? So in general, the goal is to get at least a one centimeter surgical margin circumferentially around the lesion. This picture on the left I know shows two centimeters, but in general, you wanna get at least a one centimeter surgical margin. And then um, for a lesion that is not invasive, if you don't have a concern about an invasive lesion, then you just need to go um, to the dermis. You don't wanna go beyond the subcutaneous tissue beneath the lesion. So it's about um, a three to four millimeter, excuse me, three to four millimeter depth of invasion when, when um, excising this. So it's, it's fairly shallow. And then when reapproximating the tissue, you can use um, 2030 or 40 vicryl uh, to reapproximate the dead space and, um, and close the skin. And when I close the skin edges, I usually uh, perform this with either interrupted vertical mattress sutures, depending on how large the incision is, or you can use um, a subcuticular stitch as well. Uh, patients do need to be counseled about, um, they basically need to be given appropriate perioperative instruction on how to care for these incisions afterwards. They're obviously in a terrible area. They're very uncomfortable. Healing can actually be quite dragged out. Um, there's a high risk of infection, uh, which is not surprising, a high risk of wound breakdown. So I do have a long conversation with patients about these things before surgery so that they are on board. Um, they understand the importance of keeping the areas clean, using sits baths. Um, we provide uh, bacitracin and, and silvidine cream um, to help to provide, to alleviate some of the symptoms associated with this, the incision and the surgery. Um, and, and then try to prepare them for any potential complication and they know to call me with any issues. So that, that's one option. Again, that's my preference, certainly something that would be recommended for patients who you are worried about who have an invasive lesion, a larger lesion, someone who's been um, refractory to medical therapy, for example, or patients who might have uh, recurrent disease. Um, in terms of how to do it, so whether you do wide local excision, laser ablation, vulvectomy, partial vulvectomy, uh, a, pub, a paper was published in the journal, um, the Gynoc Journal in 2005. Um, this is a meta-analysis of about 97 different publications that looked over at over 3,300 patients, and they did not show us that they did not find a significant difference in recurrence rate, um, no matter how you perform the procedure. Um, so in general, I think a wide local excision is certainly preferable to, than, to performing a vulvectomy. Surgical margins are important, however. Again, the goal is to get a negative surgical margin. There's still a risk of recurrence, even with a negative surgical margin of about 20%. But if you have a positive surgical margin, that risk jumps to about 40%. Um, and so for patients who do have a positive margin, if there is gross visible disease, I encourage you to bring these patients back to the operating room to excise that visible lesion. If there is no obvious visible lesion, you do not need to resect. These patients should be watched very closely and if a recurrence does occur, um, these patients can then be brought back to the operating room to excise again or laser or use a topical medical therapy, but you don't need to bring someone back if they don't have an obvious uh, lesion, even though the pathology report showed that the they had um, positive margins. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at one of the questions that popped up about the HPV vaccine. Um, in a patient over 60, um, I probably wouldn't recommend it to someone over 60 because I don't know how much benefit it would have for a patient at that point. Um, but that's certainly a very good question. I'd have to think more about that. I don't, I don't know what my upper limit of age would be when I would stop recommending or more aggressively recommend the HPV vaccine. Um, I certainly have recommended it to older patients and they've requested it at older ages, but um, at 60 with a low grade lesion, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Hmm. 
Uh, laser ablation is the section, second option for patients with vulvar high-grade dysplasia. You can use this for single or multifocal disease. Obviously, laser has to be done by somebody who knows how to use the laser, who is credentialed to use the laser. Um, I don't use it a whole lot, um, but it is very useful, particularly when treating lesions around the clitoris, the urethra, um, and the anus, where you can't really... Um, you know, you, you can't get huge, lot, large surgical margins without affecting the function of those nearby structures. So it's very useful for those lesions. Um, you should try to get a half a centimeter to one centimeter margin when treating the area. And it does require that you destroy the area, the cells through throughout the entire thickness of the epithelium. So on hair bearing areas, you wanna to get to about three millimeters. Um, because you need to make sure that in addition to the epidermis, you're ablating the hair follicles too, because the hair follicles, which are a little bit deeper, can contain h cell as well. On the non-hair bearing areas, you don't have to go quite as deep. Um, up to two millimeters is fine for the, the deep margin. But again, this is something that is performed by people um, uh, like myself, Gynok, or Dr. McKinney, who um, specializes in the treatment of vulvar conditions and vulvar dysplasia. Um, and, and should be reserved. Uh, so the, you know, if a patient is, is interested in, in laser ablation, certainly have them come talk to us anytime. And then finally, medical therapy. So we can treat vulvar H cell. And as we, are, we mentioned before, low-grade dysplasia as well with topical imiquimod. So topical imiquimod is a cream, it's a topical immune, mod, um, immune response modifier. Um, this particular medication binds to tolerolite receptor 7 on immature dendritic cells, and it acts on both the innate and adaptive immune response, and um, both directly and indirectly, and essentially can cause apoptosis um, in, in tumor cells. It increases the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It, rec it recruits T cells and antigen-presenting cells and just upregulates the immune response um, and is very useful in environments where there is HPV, which um, suppresses the presence of T cells. And um, by upregulating the, the immune response in that microenvironment, it helps to fight the HPV virus, but also helps to um, have, cause regression of vulvar dysplasia. So when prescribing a mod, um, patients are, it comes in a, um, a package of little blister packets and each contains a small amount of the cream. And it's important if you're going to prescribe the medication to show patients, make sure that you and the patient are both on the same page with respect to where the lesions are. You only want to have them apply the medication to the lesion, not smearing it all over the entire vulva. Um, because that's going to cause a lot of um, side effect that the patient will not enjoy. Um, encourage the patients to wash their hands before and after application of the imiquimod. Um, they can even use a Q-tip to apply to the area. They want to apply the medication at nighttime before bed, so they're getting the maximum of exposure. And you want to counsel them that they should only have this medication on their um, on the lesions for about six to 10 hours. And then after um, they wake up and they should shower and, and wash the, the medication off. Um, the goal is to work up to three times per week for 16 weeks. So um, in addition to treating, to teaching the patients where to apply the medication, it's important obviously to counsel the patients about what side effects they might experience. Um, and those include pain that can cause erythema, irritation, um, in some severe cases, it can cause blistering and burning. And so um, for my patients, when I'm prescribing imiquimod, which I, I, again, I don't do a whole lot of because people get turned off by the side effect profile. Um, the goal is to get up, get to three times a week, but I usually gradu gradually um, recommend that they work their way up to three times a week. So um, when I start the therapy, I have patients use it just once a week for two weeks and then up, um, trend up to two times a week for an additional two weeks and then get to three weeks by the, the fifth week if they can tolerate that. If they can't tolerate more than twice a week, then that's okay. And then ultimately you want to treat them for um, no more than 16 weeks. And in general, I have patients come back to see me after the eight week mark to make sure that they're tolerating therapy, that the lesions are actually responding to therapy and not progressing through the disease. 
Um, and we, we know that it's okay to use imiquimod for patients with vulvar H cell because of um, several randomized controlled trials that have been done and other analyses that have been done suggesting that it is effective. This is just one of the randomized, randomized controlled trials that has been done. This was um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. It was a randomized controlled trial that enrolled um, just 52 patients with multifocal um, high-grade dysplasia and ultimately randomly assigned this, these patients to imiquimod or placebo. And the patients were asked to apply the imiquimod twice a week um, for 16 weeks or, or the placebo. And the primary outcome of the study was to um, cause reduction in the lesion size or the total lesion size by more than 25%. And there were secondary outcomes as well in this, and these looked at histologic regression, clearance of HPV from the lesion, change in immune cells in the epidermis and dermis of the vulva, relief of symptoms, improvement in quality of life and durability of response. Um, this is a little bit um, of a busy slide, but in this panel on the left, this figure is figure one from the paper. Um, this compares um, the response for patients in the imiquimod arm to the response to therapy in the placebo arm. And this shows um, all of the patients at this mark here at baseline. Um, and then patients were evaluated uh, every four weeks during the study. And so this reports the change in the size of the lesions at 20 weeks, and then they follow the patients out to 12 months. And so here we see that the size of the lesions are decreasing in a majority of the patients who are exposed to imiquimod as opposed to placebo in the panel below. Um, about 80% or greater than 80% of patients had greater than a 25% reduction in the total size of their vulvar lesions in the imiquimod group at 20 weeks, which is seen here. Um, this solid red line represents nine of the patients in the imiquimod arm who had a complete response at 20 weeks, and this was um, durable to 12 months. Um, none of the patients in the placebo arm had a, a decrease in lesion size by more than 25%, which really is not you know, terribly surprising. Um, this table shows the clinical response at 20 weeks and at 12 months, comparing the imiquimod arm to the placebo arm. And again, we see those nine patients here who had complete response in the um, study arm, and this continued out, uh, so a pretty decent durable response at 12 months. And there were 12 patients who had a partial response and, no, and uh, five patients who had no response in the study arm. Um, as opposed to uh, 26 patients, so all of the patients in the placebo arm who had no sign of response at 20 weeks or, or um, and then at 12, 12 months, excuse me, there was some response, um, but you will essentially that um, some of those lesions regressed, but some of the lesions as they went back and recategorized, they think were not all VIN two or three. Um, the other interesting part is that in addition to measuring the size of the lesion and demonstrating that these lesions decreased in size, they also looked to see if there was regression in terms of histology. And um, they looked, they did HPV testing at, at baseline. And then again, at 20 weeks, um, looked at the lesions and showed that for the patients who received imiquimod, um, eight of the patients at 20 weeks who had no no disease, no visible disease, um, no pathologic disease, all of those lesions or all of those biopsies also did not contain HPV. So, um, and then interestingly, the patients who had persistent VIN-3 in the imiquimod group, all of them still had HPV. So there was um, an association between a regression of histology and presence or absence of HPV in the, in the um, patients who actually responded to therapy. So in summary, at 20 weeks, the lesion size uh, for patients with BIN2 or BIN3 in this randomized trial reduced by 25% in 80 and greater than 80% of patients. And the, they saw a complete response in nine or 35% of the treated patients, as well as a partial response in 12 of those patients or 46%, which then adds up to that 81%. Um, all of the nine patients with the complete regression at 20 weeks had uh, were also disease free at 12 months. Um, and then we saw histologic regression in 70% of the patients in the imiquimod arm. And then interestingly, HPV was cleared by imiquimod in 15 of the 25 patients who started out with 
um, HPV present in their lesion um, compared to only two of 25 in the control arm. So imiquimod is certainly a safe option to use in this um, as an alternative to surgical excision or laser ablation in this population. When using topical therapy, uh, it is important to make sure that you watch these patients closely um, and perform vulvoscopy during their follow-up to make sure that the patients are responding, they're not developing any new lesions and they're not progressing on treatment. Um, as I mentioned, patients can develop significant symptoms and side effects related to the, the treatment itself. So please counsel the patients appropriately before they start treatment and, and suggest that they trend up with a goal to do three times a week, but definitely don't start at three times a week because it can be so painful and, and quite symptomatic for patients. Um, and then if patients don't respond to treatment, um, then you wanna reevaluate and discuss alternative options for these patients who have residual disease or just fail treatment altogether. Um, and then for patients who are immunosuppressed, there is very limited experience with the use of imiquimod in this population. So if you, it's not that you can't use it, but I would be very upfront with patients and counsel them extensively if you're gonna use it in patients who are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised um, before, before prescribing um, because it may not work as well. Uh, despite adequate treatment recurrence rates for high-grade squamous endothelial lesions of the vulva um, can range up to 50% and patients who have multifocal disease have a greater risk of recurrence. So it's important to watch these patients very closely. And unfortunately they can develop recurrence of the high-grade dysplasia or vulvar cancer at any point throughout their lifetime. Um, the, of the three professional societies, ASCCP and ACOG recommend follow-up at six months and 12 months after com completing treatment. Um, and then annually thereafter. SGO suggests every six months for five years. So it really depends on the lesion, um, your patient, and, and what your comfort and their comfort level is in, ter what, in terms of what uh, follow-up should be. Um, and then in, for differentiated bin, this is also another high-grade bulbar dysplasia, but not associated with the oncogenic strains of HPV. This is typically associated with lichen sclerosis, but unfortunately, it's more likely to progress to invasive squamous cell carcinoma, and these patients tend to have worse oncologic outcomes. The time for um, progression from D-bin to cancer as opposed to H-cell to cancer is shorter. Um, again, these are much more virulent than H-cell. And so surgical excision is recommended for all patients with DVIN because we, um, we get the risk of finding concurrent squamous cell carcinoma at the time of diagnosis is also greater than with H-cell. So um, laser ablation and medical management are, are not favored for patients with DVIN. And then moving along to vulvar dermatoses, I'm gonna to try to go through these quickly so I can leave some time for questions. Um, but lichen sclerosis, we know, um, is a chronic autoimmune disease. It results in um, these hypopigmented lesions on the vulva, um, and it can, over time, lead to architect architectural changes of the skin. It can be quite uncomfortable, causing irritation, pruritus, dyspareunia, and, and more often um, affects patients that are of perimenopausal or menopausal age, but we can see this in, in uh, prepubescent patients as well. Uh, the presence of lichen sclerosis increases the risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva, and uh, we can see squamous cell carcinoma in about three to nine percent of patients with lichen sclerosis. Uh, auto, um, lichen planus is another autoimmune condition that occurs in about two percent of patients, um, women ages 30 to 60 years old. Um, this affects the mucous membranes of the body, so it can be present in the, in the mouth, but also in the vulva and the vagina. It can cause erosive and non-erosive changes, which can be accompanied by pain. Patients may have postcoital uh, post bleeding or pruritus. And the lesions are different from that of lichen sclerosis and then they're, they're very well demarcated. They can have um, an erythematous, present as an erythematous patch. Um, they're typically erosive, but as mentioned above, can be non-erosive as well. And they may have um, white or violaceous borders, um, also known, known as Wickham striae, that can be pathognomonic for this, for making a diagnosis just, just based on visual inspection. Um, treatment is very similar to lichen sclerosis. So first-line therapy for lichen sclerosis and lichen planus are, are often very effective. And so the, the first-line treatment includes 
uh, ultra potent topical steroids, including clobetazole or betamethasone. Um, and in terms of treatment in general, I recommend that patients use it nightly uh, for 12 weeks. And then I see them back to see how they're responding. But you can also do therapy twice a day for a month and then nightly for a month and then have the patients continue for two to three nights per week, um, sort of indefinitely. If patients don't respond to the clobetazole or the betamethasone or halobetazole, whatever um, topical steroid you're using, you can add in um, a topical calcineurin inhibitor called tacrolimus. This is also an ointment and you can use this twice a day. And if, you're, if you are substituting it, you, you just use it twice a day. Um, but if you're using it in conjunction with clobetazole, you can use this um, on alternating nights when you're not using the clobetazole therapy and then every morning. And then finally, for very refractory cases, um, you may also add oral prednisone. So use a systemic therapy for patients with refractory disease that are quite symptomatic um, and continue a very long taper. I've personally never done that before. There's this great article in this, this month's um, journal, uh, Green Journal, that, uh, that talks about and basically reviews different options for the treatments of more refractory and challenging cases of lichen, uh, lichen sclerosis and lichen planus. So open up uh, the September edition of the Green Journal. And um, I found this very interesting and, and very helpful, but there's certainly therapies in it that they suggest um, that I would not feel comfortable using myself, but, and we'll go over that. Um, so again, clobetazole is considered the gold standard in the first line therapy. It may not be affordable depending on the patient's medical insurance. And so you can also use betamethasone or halobetazole as options. Um, and the way it works is through anti-inflammatory and antimitotic or immunosuppressive effects. It's not perfect. Um, it, the efficacy is about 70 to 95% in terms of improving patients, patient symptoms, um, but only results in complete remission in about a quarter to half of cases. Um, you can continue it indefinitely, but if you have a patient who's been on clobetazole indefinitely, that can cause its own problems. And so um, you may wanna give them a holiday or have them build in use of topical estrogen um, to prevent too much thinning of the tissue. So and I have a question that popped up. Sure. It says, have you used injectable steroids, e.g. kind of lodge for ooh, refractory LSA lesions? You might have to read that again. Because... Sure. Um, so Dr. DeGruy, I've actually, I've personally never used injectable steroids. It is, it is an option, um, but I, I personally haven't used this. There was a vulvar specialist that I would refer a lot of these patients to when I was working in Baltimore, um, and he would do these for some patients, uh, but I personally don't have experience. And so in this article, they don't actually talk about the use of injectable steroids. Um, so they just mention uh, the topical steroids, and then they talk about using um, systemic steroids orally, but they don't mention anything about um, injectables either. Um, the ones that the other therapies they do mention for the refractory cases um, include this top, topical tacrolimus, which you can use twice a day. This, similar to amiquimod, can cause burning after application. So if, for patients, you want to make sure that they understand that that is, a, that is a side effect when they initiate therapy. And you can consider prescribing topical lidocaine that they can use before applying the therapy. Um, other options, again, these are things that um, I would start consulting with other colleagues before I use, but um, methotrexate can be given with or without steroids. Um, obviously for, for methotrexate, similar to patients who are being treated for an ectopic pregnancy or, or gestational trophoblastic disease, you need to monitor these patients um, with respect to GI, liver, and, and renal function. Um, so they need Blood work, um, you know, if you're using this therapy long-term, they need an, um, an MRI of the liver after getting a cumulative dose of two grams. And so this is something definitely for patients that have more refractory therapy. Cell sept is another option um, with the, uh, the goal to get to a dose of about two to three grams per day. The major side effect is diarrhea. And similarly, you need to monitor labs for these patients. Um, so certainly these things are just totally outside the box, but 
options for patients. And, um, and again, this is when I would be consulting with maybe a dermatologist or a vulvar dermatologist to get their opinion and, and their expertise. Um, hydroxychloroquine can also be used mainly for like in cleanest, but can also be used for more complex cases of lichen sclerosis as well. Um, and then in the June edition of the Green Journal this year, they talk about, um, there's a randomized control trial that compares clobetazole to fractionated CO2 laser. And this is a randomized control trial that recruited patients over a three year period, also recruited and enrolled 52 patients to this study and essentially randomized them to either use of topical clobetazole or three treatments with the fractionated CO2 laser. Um, and the primary outcome was a change in patient's symptoms at six months. And so they completed a lot of validated questionnaires, including this Skindex 29 score, um, and showed that the patients who were treated with fractionated CO2 had an improvement in their symptoms and also in their um, examinations compared to clobetazole. And, and apparently, um, in this group of patients who had prior exposure to clobetazole and then were treated with the laser, uh, they had greater improvement in symptoms. Um, I will say that this is investigational. So per the uh, per ACOG and the International so Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease, their laser should still be considered investigational for patients who have genitourinary syndrome of menopause or lichen sclerosis. But, um, more investigation needs to be done. So it's certainly an interesting option, um, but should be only used on, on trial. So um, in conclusion, so vulvar LCIL is also known as VIN1 or condyloma. You don't need to treat unless patients are having a lot of symptoms or you're really worried um, that they may not actually have LCIL, um, but it's not considered a precancerous condition. So um, you know, it's not something that needs to absolutely be treated. Vulvar LH cell is considered a precancerous lesion, absolutely needs to be treated. It's associated with the oncogenic strains of HPV. Um, and the three options for treatment include surgical excision, laser ablation, or ultrasonic aspiration or medical management. Um, regardless how, how you treat these patients or excise these lesions, recurrence rates are similar. So it's imperative that patients with a history of vulvar H cell be watched closely. Um, differentiated VIN, not associated with VIN, uh, excuse me, with HPV, but is um, associated with lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, and is more likely to progress to vulvar cancer than vulvar H cell. And so it's important that we surgically resect these lesions um, to prevent cancer. Lichen sclerosis is a precur precursor to differentiated VIN. Um, as we all know, it can be very disfiguring, can cause tremendous symptoms, and the standard of care is to the, um, the first line treatment is with topical steroids, such as clobetazole. Uh, lichen planus can be treated similarly, and then there's that whole host of other options for patients with more refractory diseases. This can be very symptomatic and quite challenging um, for some of our patients, and I'm sure we all have some of those patients who we just can't seem to, to help. Um, and I will say that, you know, when in doubt, always biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. If patients aren't responding to treatment, biopsy again um, when your therapy uh, isn't working, just biopsy again when, when your exam and pathology are discrepant, biopsy. Um, and then certainly if you ever have questions or you don't feel you don't feel that something's right, you have a question about pathology, send these patients to Dr. McKinney, send these patients up to see us. We have clinics in Milton and Plymouth, Chestnut Hill, Dedham, and obviously in Boston. Um, we're always happy to curb any questions um, via email or, and you can call us. Um, this is our office number. So uh, with that, I, um, I thank you for your attention. And um, with the last few minutes we have remaining, I'd love to open it up to any questions you may have. So I'm just gonna pull up the Q&A. Oh, so Dr. McKinney, to answer Dr. DeGroote's question, um, she says that she has used injectable, um, I think the injectable steroids, and she starts at a concentration of five milligrams every three months. Um, I'm sorry, monthly for three months. So hopefully that answers Dr. DeGroote's question. So now we open up for questions. Does anybody have any um, additional questions they'd like to ask Dr. Ducey? Uh, 
if there are no questions, I, I thank you again for your time and attention. Feel free to, to email or call me with anything. Um, and, and hopefully if I haven't yet met you, uh, we'll get to meet each other in person sometime in the future. Um, but I wish you all a good night and uh, thank you again for, for coming today.